the song. What do I mean by the song of the queen? What I'm talking about are the, the systems of communication, the intricate sensory devices that they have where they're communicating when queens and workers are, are influencing each other. Uh, workers are communicating back with queens. Uh, larvae and the nurse bees that feed them, they communicate with each other. It's all part of this, this, this song. Uh, there's communication among queens. They talk to each other in, in, in certain sensory uh, modalities. Uh, queens and drums, and even among drums. They use different kinds of instruments and sensory modalities for this song that they sing, this communication system that they, that they use between each other. Uh, they use pheromones. Pheromones are what I call chemical notes. Uh, they're compounds that are produced in glands uh, inside the body that are then excreted to the outside of the body. And then these chemicals, when they're perceived by other individuals, modify their behavior in certain ways. So the chemical notes that are produced are detected with olfactory and gustatory receptors. They, the other individuals smell them and can taste them. Substrate vibrations, that's another instrument that's used. And the notes are auditory notes, uh, sound. Now we hear them as sound because we have organs for hearing and detecting vibrations through the air. Uh, and these vibrations are typically produced by wing vibrations, but in the bees they're detected with a special organ called a cordotonal organ. These organs don't hear like we do. They're not built with a, t with a tympanum that vibrates. These are organs that are located between the joints, maybe the joints of the antennae, the joints of the body, the joints of the legs. And what they feel vibrations by, by the individual parts articulating with each other and they detect the articulations. So they can sit on the substrate of a comb and they can feel a vibration. And so individuals can, can communicate through vibrations that are in the substrate itself. Tactile, touch. They feel touch like we do. There's, there's, Touch notes that are that are that are produced just by visual, like contact, individual contact in the nest, rubbing up against each other. They do these these specific kinds of they call them dances, where one might get on top of the other, vibrate upside up and down on top of them, and they'll detect it with their tactile sensilla. These are hair-like structures that, when they're deflected, they 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 send. Um, electrical signals through the neurons, and then the individual can detect that, that sense like a sense of touch. And then visual. Visual uh, system detects movement, and they can do, it can do image identification, uh, and they detect these with their compound eyes. The succession of a nest is an important event in the, in the life history of a colony. And this is the time when the queens change. Uh, a queen is replaced by her daughter. Uh, and they happen under special circumstances, which I will discuss in a moment. Uh, but when there's a, say, a succession of the nest during swarming, uh, when colonies reproduce, uh, a colony will typically make between 15 and 20 new queens. Uh, these queens are raised in special queen cells, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, the old queen will then depart, if it's a swarm, she'll depart, and about half the bees of the colony will go with her. And then they'll leave behind about half the bees with these developing queen cells that contain these new queens that have been, that have been produced. Uh, sometimes what we call after swarms go, after the queen leaves with half the bees, uh, the old queen, the mother, uh, none of the virgin queens may emerge and then take off and some of the bees will go with her also. That's an after swarm. But then in the end, after the swarming and the after swarming, there's a duel to the death among the remaining queens uh, that are left behind of this 15 to 20 new queens that were produced during the swarming event. event. Uh, the surviving queen of that, that queen duel uh, will then go out and mate. She'll fly through the air and mate. Uh, she'll return to the nest. Uh, the sperm that she picked up on these, this mating flight that she took will migrate into the spermatheca. And then, oh, about one to two weeks after she came out as an adult, uh, she'll begin egg laying in the maternal nest, the nest that was left behind for her when her mother left. <clears throat> the song begins with the construction of the queen cells. 
uh, the queen cells are very different from the worker cells, as you can see on this, on this figure. The queen cells are larger. They're about the size of a peanut. Uh, they look a lot like a peanut. And they hang vertically upside down on, uh, on the other parts of the comb. <clears throat> the, um, the workers are raised individually in these hexagonal shaped cells, <clears throat> shown on the right. <clears throat> one individual per cell. And there, these cells are, are oriented horizontally, not vertically, uh, but both of them are fed by nurse bees. But the making of a queen is a duet. <clears throat> it's not a single, a single instrument being played. It's a duet between, between the queens and the workers. They, the, the larvae are communicating with the workers they're giving them information about their size, their age, et cetera. And then the workers are, are feeding them back the kinds of foods and substances that they need in order to develop into whatever they're supposed to be, whether it's a queen or it's a worker. The larvae produce pheromones. So they're, they're communicating with the use of these chemical, these chemical signals that are produced uh, in in glands that are near the surface of their, of their body, the, 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 larva, the larva's body, and secreted to the exterior of the larva, and they sit on the surface. The nurse bees, these are the bees that feed the larvae and tend to the larvae, pick up these, these chemical compounds, and then they respond by feeding them the appropriate substances. This is a musical score. It, it's something that's played out over time and it changes uh, over time. So a larva will go through several stages of development over the course of uh, six or seven days of larval development. It takes three days for a larva to hatch from the egg, from the time that the queen lays it. And then there's gonna be somewhere up to about uh, six or seven days, whether it's a queen or it's a, a, a worker larva, where they're going to be going through these various stages of development. Then they become a pupa, and they'll be a pupa for a number of days, and then they will emerge as an adult. A queen emerges as an adult 16 days after the egg was laid. A worker emerges as an adult 21 days after the egg was laid. A drone emerges as an adult 24 days after the egg was laid. During the first three larval instars, an instar is a stage of development where a larva grows and feeds, and then for it to grow more, it has to, it has to shed its exterior skin. And when it sheds that skin, then the soft-bodied larva that's inside of that skin, it can then grow and expand for some other stage. Each of those stages is called an instar. So for the first three larval instars, the queen larva gets fed uh, a, queen, a diet that's fed to them from the, the proteinaceous glands, these head glands of, of nurse bees, that contains the protein and it's high in sugar. Uh, the sugar comes from honey and nectar that's provided. So the sugar content is high and the queen is fed ad lib. All she can take, they feed this larva every, all the, the full amount of anything it can take in. The worker diet is the same with respect to being ad lib. It's the same food and it's fed ad lib for those first three larval instars, first two and a half days of their life, uh, but it's low in sugar. So the queen gets more sugar than the workers, the queen larva does, than a worker larva. In the third and fourth larval instars, when they're about two and a half to four days old, the queen is still getting fed high sugar and she's getting fed ad lib, all she can possibly take in. But the worker's diet changes. Now the score, the musical score changes and she's now getting uh, a, still a low sugar content of food, but it's restricted. She's not getting all she can eat. They're holding back. They're, she's staying a little bit hungry. They're not feeding it as much as they're feeding to the queen larva. In the fifth larval instar, this is about the fourth to sixth day, uh, the, the feeding regime of the queen remains the same, but the worker changes. Now they get high sugar and a restricted food. So they're still not getting all they can eat, 
but now it's high in sugar again. It's back like what the queen had. And so this is sort of an orchestrated diet. Then right at the time they become a pre-pupa, uh, before they become a, just before they become a pre-pupa, the queen gets fed a large amount of food and then the cell is capped. And then the queen can continue to feed for another day. She'll eat, consume that food inside of that cap cell where the, the workers are no longer visiting it, the, it individually, but she will consume that extra food. Then she'll spin her cocoon and, form, and go through her pupil development. The workers, on the other hand, they get sealed into their cells without food. They starve the last day of, of development uh, in their cells. And these, these changes, these differences in these diets are responsible for those very different looking features of queens and workers. Now we can do this too. We can feed um, uh, larvae in the laboratory. And we've done lots and lots and lots of this. And you know, we can do it all kinds of ways. We can give them big blobs of food and we can put a whole bunch of larvae on it. And, and, or we can feed them a little bit at a time. We've done it all these different ways. And we, we can raise them. We can raise them up to be adults, just doing it by hand. We, we take the food from, from the colonies, from what they're feeding the other larvae. We take them into the lab. But the, but the timing and the amounts and the amount of sugar is very critical. It's very critical that that score gets played out in the way that it's supposed to be played out in order to get the features of queens and workers uh, that you're looking for or that they're looking for. Um, so I call, when we do this, I call loss of harmony. We can get them, we can get those individuals, but we don't get them looking exactly like the, they get them when they raise them themselves. The, the, the chief queen and worker characters that we look at, we're looking, looking at good queens versus workers, have to do with the body mass, the size of the body and the size of the ovaries. So on the left, you have a queen. You can see that she has about twice the body mass of a, of a worker. Uh, and then when you look at the ovaries uh, there that are next to her, the ovaries are composed of long filaments. Though each of those filaments is called an ovarial. And those ov ovarials make up the ovary and a queen can have up to more than 300 ovarials. Each of those ovarials is a factory for making eggs. The eggs are produced and then they pass down, they go through the oviduct and, and, and they get laid into the, into the cells. The worker on the other hand, you look at her, this particular one has two ovarials per ovary compared to you know, 150 or so for the queen uh, on the left. The, the, the worker, can in fact lay eggs, and they do lay eggs under some circumstances. When colonies become hopelessly queenless, the workers' ovaries will develop and they will lay eggs that, are, that develop into males because they don't mate. Um, but we can, we can look at those as the prime characters of the queens and workers, and we can see how well we do. The Queens are the green box around queens. That represents the phenotype, the relationship of body mass to the number of ovarials uh, for queens that are raised by workers, nurses in their own nest. So when the workers do it, all the queens they produce come out inside where that box is with respect to how the body mass that they have and the number of ovarials. It's a defined space. The workers, on the other hand, the, the worker larvae, they come out in that small box down into lower into the left of it. And inside of that is where almost all workers' uh, phenotypes belong. All those other dots everywhere you see that are outside of those boxes, those are the ones we made. Those are the ones where we didn't play the, 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 the score correctly. Uh, where we had a disharmonious uh, method of rearing them, and we got all those other phenotypes. This shows the relationship, this duet relationship. It's a dual thing between the larva and the workers, orchestrating the development of the individual.